This morning we come again to the book of James. We come, in fact, to some of the same verses that we've been looking at over the last few weeks. If you have your Bible, please do turn with me, in fact, to the book of Nehemiah one more time. That's the first place we'll land in a passage that is not. So go ahead and go to their table of contents. Look in your table of contents and find the, the, the uh, book of Nehemiah, and then you'll want to go to Nehemiah chapter 8. We'll be there in just a moment. We've been looking at the little book of James, and the little book of James helps us ask a few questions, and it helps us determine um, some things that we need to know. If you don't have an outline, these guys have an outline. They'll give one to you. Just lift your hand. The book of James helps people know whether or not they're really a Christian. The book of James is a bit of, of advice and counsel for you and for me to be able to look at this letter and determine whether or not we truly live according to what God says is a Christian, not our culture, not the people around us, not other things that are outside of God's Word, but inside of God's Word. James was a pastor in Jerusalem, and he was very concerned that people not only in his church in Jerusalem, but churches all over, not only the Mediterranean world, but even um, to the east of Jerusalem, all over the ancient world where there were Jewish Christians, he was concerned that many of them were religious, but they did not know God. They would go meet with other Jewish Christians. They would go and they knew the right lingo. They knew the right festivals. They knew the right um, wet dress and the right habits, but their hearts were far from God. And so James writes to them, challenging them and helping them see what a true Christian really looks like. If our, if our review is here, we, we come to that box on the page, and I want us to just read the passage. We'll quickly look at the review, and then we'll look at three very important phrases that I believe are critical, absolutely critical, for Sheridan Hills Baptist Church to understand. Notice there with me, James chapter 1, this is in the box on the page, James chapter 1, verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness, remember that's the opposite of anger that's spoken up there before, some people are angered by the Word of God. Here he's saying, instead, be meek and receive, what does it say? Receive with meekness the implanted Word, which is able to save your souls. Look at verse 22. But be doers of the Word, and not merely hearers deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. Verse 24, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of what? Liberty. Liberty. And perseveres being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who does what? Who acts. He will be blessed in his doing. Last week, we looked very intently at this idea, and fill these in. The true followers of Christ obey his commands. True followers of Christ obey his commands. There's a very real possibility of not being a true follower of Christ. You can call yourself a Christian, but if you don't live as Christ has commanded us to live, then you are clearly just something from our culture or something from something, some other influence that's around us. John 15, 14 says, Jesus said, you are my friends if you do what I command you. John 14, 23 says, Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will will come into him and make our home with him. And then 1 John chapter 2 verse 3 says, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The Bible is replete and from Genesis to Revelation, the picture is those who know God obey God. That is critical for us to understand. Look at the next part here. A sure sign that you are not a follower of Christ is that you do not keep his commands. 
This is, this is very, very clear. In John 14, 24, it says, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So there's, there's many that would say, well, I'm a Christian, but, but when you get down to it, they're not looking to God, they're not listening to God, they're not obeying God, they're not trusting God in their daily life. They, are, they come to church, they come in and they sit and they go, wow, that's nice, and I feel good, I feel better about my, and then they go on out of this building to live their life not at all changed, listening, or obeying what the creator of the universe is saying to them through his word and through his church. Notice here, it's not an issue of claiming to be a Christian, it's an issue of living as a Christian. You can claim to be a Christian all you want, but that doesn't make you a Christian. What shows that you are a Christian, what reveals that God has come and transformed your heart, that the Holy Spirit has called you to himself and you have believed upon him, what shows that is your obedience. That's what proves it. It's living as a Christian. That's not what saves you. And notice the next part here. Our obedience does not earn our status as children of God. Your obedience does not earn your status as children of God. There's only one who can earn your status as a child of God. Who's that? The Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. That is our only hope. He did all of the work necessary, and all we are called to do is to believe. It's not by works that we are saved, but our obedience does reveal our status as children of God. Not only do we now have the will to obey and that we start to obey Him, but listen to this, His power comes and gives us the power to obey. And so it's the evidence that he has come and changed our lives. Now, last week, we looked at the story of Nehemiah. You remember chapters 8 through 10, and there's, this is very, very important. This is, this is critically important. In fact, if I, Marcy, can you hand me your pen for just a moment? Um, if you have a pen from this pew back um, in front of you, the pens that are in the room, I think there's some gray ones, and I think that there's also some white ones. But notice the passage of Scripture that is there. On Psalm 119, 107, it says, Revive me, O Lord. How? According to your word. In fact, if you look through Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, if you look through Psalm 119 over and over and over again, the psalmist is saying that, Lord, your word revives us. Your word is what brings life to us. It's truth. It's the truth of God that brings life to the human heart. Here you go, babe. Um, thank you. We see that in what goes on with Nehemiah and the Jewish nation. They had been in um, captivity in Babylon. They come back. They build the temple. Then they build the wall and then so now they have their temple reestablished. They have the wall around the city. And do you remember what they did next? In, Rome, or in Nehemiah chapter 8, it says, then Nehemiah, they constructed a wooden pulpit. They constructed a wooden elevated place where the people could gather around. And they read the law of Moses. They read Genesis, Exodus, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They read these books to the people. Thousands of people standing there before them. They stayed there for hours as they read the Word of God. You see, they had been off in Babylon. They had been far away. And, and as we saw, as we see many, many times, and it's recounted in Nehemiah chapter 9, God would bring them to himself, they would stay with him for a little while, and then they would rebel, and they would run out after other gods, they would, they would not do what he said, and then he would bring someone to come, to come get their attention, and they would suffer greatly, and it was through that suffering that they would cry out to God again, and God mercifully would hear from them, hear them, and he would come and draw them to himself again. And if you read Nehemiah chapter 9, you see that over and over and over again, we see the patience of the Lord being tested, and yet he's, he's filled with forgiveness, and he's filled with grace, but it's, it's his word that keeps drawing the people back to himself. And so, 
they read the word, and notice this on your outline, God's people are restored by God's word after rebuilding the temple, the wall around Jerusalem. The people gathered, the reading and teaching of the word, and their first response we see is confession over their sin. These people stood there, they heard the word for hours upon end, and you know what their response was? Weeping, because they knew they had sinned against a holy God. You see, the Word of God begins to reveal our sin. The Word of God reveals who God is and who we are not. And the Word of God shows us our lacking. The Word of God shows us how far we fall short. In fact, the word sin means to fall short or to miss the mark. And so that's what God's Word does. If sometimes when you read the Word, you're convicted about your attitude or you're convicted about behavior in your life, you're convicted, convicted about unbelief, listen, that is God's gracious Word to you calling you to repent. And so what we see here is that they confess their sin. They don't argue with God. They don't say, yeah, but it was hot in that desert, and Moses went up on the mountain, and he stayed up on the mountain for a long time, and so we built a calf because we needed help out of there, and we, yeah, we were wrong. They didn't make excuses. With Nehemiah, and before with the Levites and all of the priests that were there, they confessed their sins to God. And then, notice here, the second response was a celebration of forgiveness. Because the law, the Word of God, in it we see the sacrifice that takes away our sins. And so the people rejoice that this God is a forgiving God. Friends, when they heard the Word, they confess their sin, they celebrated God's forgiveness. Just read those chapters. And then they made a covenant to obey. And this is where I want you to see in Romans chapter, um, chapter 8. Look at the uh, chapter 8, verse 8. Uh, just kind of unpack this a little bit. They read from the book they read from a book from the law of God clearly and gave the sense. That means that there was teaching so that the people understood the reading. And then there was a, there was a great confession of their sin. And we see down through chapter 9, you see at the top of chapter 9, perhaps if your Bible is in ESV, it says, the people of Israel confess their sin. And they, they, they just go through and they tell the story of over and over and over again of, of God's forgiveness toward them. And then look with me at the end of chapter 9 in verse 38. Because of all this, talking about all of their sinfulness and God's forgiveness over and over, look at 9 verse 38. Because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. And then it flows in to chapter 10. And you see all of those names that are there. And that is part of the picture. So what did they do? They confessed their sin. They celebrated over it. And then they said, we're going to write it down so that we remember this day when God renewed us. And they made a written covenant. And what was their covenant? Look with me. Let your eyes go down and see what their covenant was. Look at verse 28. So chapter 10 and verse 28. The rest of the people, the priests and the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands of the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who had knowledge and understanding. So anyone that was of age to understand. Look what it says in verse 29. Join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law. And to be given by Moses, that was given by Moses, the servant of God. And so he's going to walk in the law, look at the next part, and to observe and what? And do. To observe and do 
all the commandments of the Lord our God and his rules and his statutes. And then it goes right on through. It goes all the way through. You, you read to the end of chapter 10 that, what that means. So they confessed, they celebrated, and then they made a covenant. And they wrote it down to remember to do it. Now that covenant wasn't part of the Word of God. That, that covenant didn't become Scripture. It was their commitment among themselves at that time. It's interesting. Our church has a covenant that's not so unlike that. Our church simply has a covenant that we've written down, that we've said, hey, let's remember that at this present day and time and this culture, this based upon the New Testament, based upon the Old Testament, here is what we believe God, a, a member of Sheridan Hills needs to do. And, and, and the picture is that, that we know the Lord, that we've been baptized, that we're going to love one another, that, that we're going we're to live a, a life that is honoring to the Lord. We're going to take care of one another. We're going to seek to win the world to Christ. We're going we're to support one another and care for the fellowship of Christ. And if we ever move away, we're going to find another church where we can carry out the spirit of that. We have a church covenant that we too have written down that we too say, yes, let's do that. It's so that we can be reminded to do what God has called us to do. Because God says, if you love me, you're going to do what I say. And so if it was important in Nehemiah's day, it is important in this day that God's people really look at what does God's word say and what are we doing about it. One of the prominent preachers that I love, a guy named John MacArthur, said that um, when he was in college, he was putting together a, a meeting for college students, and he had, there was a guy in Southern California from Ireland, and he was just a, a powerful, um, humble preacher um, of kind of the, the deeper life, really um, looking carefully at your, your devotion to the Lord. And John MacArthur heard that he was around, and he just he contacted him and said, would you come speak to the college students, my friends? And um, so the guy came and spoke, and it was a very powerful message, and he said it was deep, and it was, it was really convicting, and, and not just to be nice, uh, not just to share platitudes, John MacArthur went up to him afterwards and said, um, I really appreciate the things that you said. I, I was moved and I was touched by, by your message today. And the guy just looked at him and said, well, what are you going to do about it? And then turned around and started talking to somebody else. And John MacArthur said, you know, here 45, 50 years later, he remembers this. And he said, I was just being nice, and the guy, was, the guy was just very direct, and I don't know, maybe God allowed that moment so that I would remember this and say, it's nice to hear a deep message. It's nice to be challenged intellectually. It's nice to learn something new. But you need to be very careful that those intellectual triggers and those emotional triggers and the trigger of even just being together is not a substitute for obedient faith. Does that make sense? And in this present day and time, and for the last 50 or 60 years in America, it's, I, I think it's really important that we recognize that a nice, powerful, moving sermon is not what makes you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, belief that He is your only hope, and a belief in that that is manifested by a changed life. That you're going to wake up on Monday morning and seek God and seek to go be the accountant, seek to go be the sanitation worker, seek to go be the teacher, seek to go be the retired person, whatever you are, the student, honoring to God. And so there is a covenant to obey in this. And this is such a powerful picture because it is indeed throughout the Scripture that we see this. So flip your sheet over and notice with me, being a doer of the Word. And we're going to fly here. But I think that there's a, there's a few nuggets here that I believe that will shout this passage to us. The first thing that we see there in verse 22 is be a doer of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. It's a very interesting, powerful, grammatical construction that you see here. 
He uses, and underline this, I've made it on your outline bold, but look at this. He uses a substantive noun instead of an imperative verb. Now, you remember that I've said in the book of James, there, in these five chapters of James, there are 50 imperative verbs. What's an imperative verb? It is a command that you are, that you are to do this or you're to do that. He says, he says, ask for wisdom. That's an imperative. You need to ask for wisdom. He says, be patient. He, he, he gives us these, these commands that are verbs that we are to fulfill. But here he doesn't do that. Notice what he does. The word doer, poitai, means this, one who takes action. That's what the verb means. He says, be a doer of the word. He's saying, be one who takes action based upon the word. This word, doer, is only found three times in the New Testament. James 1.22, James 4.13, and Romans 2.12-13. And I want you to see Romans 2.12-13. Notice what it says on the screen. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Look at verse 13. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Now, we know that the law is not sufficient to save without the grace of Christ through the sacrifice of Christ. But that, as it comes to you, the law is fulfilled in Christ. And so when we believe upon Jesus Christ and then live like we have believed, that is the picture. If you're a hearer only of the law, even the fulfilled law of Christ, if you're a hearer only of it, you will not be justified before God. Because it simply shows that that has only been heard. It has not been internalized and believed because we do what we believe. What it does is it reveals that you don't truly believe. So we're not, we're not propagating a works-based salvation. We're not saying that works will justify you. Look carefully at the text. What, on, what it says in verse 13 is, is the hearers of the law, even a fulfilled justified law, which is inferred here from Romans chapter 2, through Christ, will be righteous before God. The doers of the law will be justified. That is the picture that your belief must be shown. And if your belief is shown, then it, re then it reveals that you have true belief in Christ, simply and only in him. You see, fill this in. He doesn't command do what, uh, the, the, what is not commanded here. He doesn't command do what the word says. That's not what this says. Do what the word says. In fact, if you have an NIV Bible, your Bible incorrectly translates that to do what the word says. That, that, that is using a verb, an imperative verb. Instead, what the real text of this says, which the, America, the New American Standard, the ESV, and a few other translations get right, says, be a doer of the word. And it, you say, why is that important? Why is that such a big deal? He says, be a doer of the word. It's kind of like this. You can go fight a war but not be a soldier. You see, you can go build a house. I built a house one time, but you're not a builder. It's something you did once, but it's not who you are. Look at the next part here. You can go teach a lesson, but not be a teacher. You see, so the picture is here that James is saying, no, you need to be a doer of the word. He doesn't say just go do the word. He doesn't just say go obey it like that. He says let it be that you are characterized as someone who is a doer of the word. It's just what you do that you obey God. That his word says it, so you do it. It's a very powerful grammatical difference that is here. You see, fill it in. This implies an ongoing active characteristic that is a chief identifier. It, 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 it is a key. It is a telltale. It, it is a 
a real point of evidence that you have saving faith in Jesus Christ is that you do what he says. Um, now, this is, this is very serious because, as I've said, there are many who hear the law. There are many who come and listen, but there's not so many who actually do what it says. Notice the next part here, and this is what's so alarming. He says, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Don't be a hearer only who deceives himself. Verse 22, you see it right there, um, not hearers only, those two words together. The word hearer is a word that literally means surprise. What do you think it means? It says, one who hears, okay? <laughs> it, it's very simple. Um, it, there, there's nothing uh, magical about that. He, he hears something. In fact, it comes from the ancient term for an auditor in the Greek language, and it's not talking about a financial auditor, but it's talking about one who, who hears something. Now, some of you have been an auditor. How many of you have ever audited a class before? Have you ever audited a class it's kind of interesting, if, you're, if you audit a class, professor, um, you go to the class, do you have to do any of the work? No. no, you don't. You're just an auditor. I mean, somebody sits there and turns around and says, hey, did you fill out, the oh, I forgot, you're an auditor, you don't have to do the work. Some of you are thinking, I've never heard of a class like that, how do I audit? Listen, you don't get credit for it either. An auditor doesn't have to do the work. But there's a lot of there's a lot of Christians who would like to just be an auditor in the Christian life. They're not really interested in doing the work of the gospel. They're not really interested in doing the work of God's kingdom. Oh, I, I just, I just want to go and do my thing, and then, and then I'm done. I feel better about it. Listen, that, that's a very dangerous place to be because here he says, don't be hearers only deceiving themselves. And, and just kind of notice this, it's, it's one who hears, and, and there's a difference between hearing and listening. You see, hearing is an act of perceiving sound with the ear. Hearing, unless you're hearing impaired, hearing just happens. You heard it. Listening is very different. Listening is actually something you consciously choose to do. Listening requires concentration. You, sometimes you're sitting there and you say, did you hear that? Yeah, I heard that. But when you want to, for somebody to hear something, what do you say? Do you say, hear it, hear it? That's not what you say. What you say is what? Listen. Listen to it. And so that's calling you to actively listen to what is there. Now, what a wise person does is, a, a wise person not only hears the Word of God, hears it being preached, but comes and listens to what it's being said, and then is not a listener only, but also a doer. And that brings me to that second word that's in this phrase. There's hearer, and then there's only. And it's the, the Greek word monon. You, you hear in that mono. What, what is the word mono? It means one or only. That's, that's what it means. If you have a mono-wing airplane, you have one wing as opposed to a bi-wing airplane. A biplane is what we would call. If you, if you have a monolingual person, that's someone who speaks with one language that, as opposed to a multilingual person that's, or a bilingual person or a trilingual person. And so this mono idea is singular, one or alone. So if you hear only, Notice the next phrase that is here. You see, or, or fill this in, place together, all they do is hear. They don't do anything else. That's all they do is hear. And what is the result of this? Deceiving yourselves. This word deceiving, paralogogizomai, says this. Paralogogizomai is this. It's to lead astray. It's to lead astray, and how? Close by or 
parallel. Do you see the word parallel in that word, paralogizomai? Now here's the dangerous part about coming and hearing the word only. You're sitting here and you're running parallel to the truth, but you're not in the truth. You're running along parallel, side by side, and it's deceptive because it's close by. You're running right down the track, side by side. One is a track of faith and works and, and that, is, that is revealed in this, and another one is listening only. It was a problem with the nation of Israel. It was a problem in the, in the New Testament church, and it's a problem today. You see, it's, it's deceiving, and it's, it's not obviously wrong. It's deceptively wrong. You see, if it was obviously wrong, that, then, then that would be much easier to say, oh, you know, I don't listen to the Word of God. I don't care about listening to the Word of God. I don't want to listen to the Word of God, but I'm a Christian. Well, you would say, well, that's pretty obvious. It's pretty obvious that you're not a Christian if you have no interest in God's truth. You have no interest in what God says. You don't believe what God says. You call yourself, well, you, you would say, well, that would be kind of dumb. It would be stupid. And I would, say, I would agree with you. It's obvious in that case. But what about the one who comes and says, ooh, ah, knows when to say amen? knows and, and, and loves to listen, but yet goes away unchanged. You say, is that possible? Absolutely. In fact, it's, as I said, one of the greatest problems in Old Testament uh, Jewish nation is that they knew the truth, but they didn't do it. It was the very thing that Jesus called out immediately. You know the truth, but you don't do it. Oh, the danger of deceiving ourselves. And see, not only is it obviously wrong and deceptively wrong, it is most dangerous of all. It's most dangerous of all. And that's why Jesus would give the, the numerous examples of people being self-deceived concerning their own faith in God. He told the, the, the parable of the sheep and the goats. He told the parable of the wheat and the tares. He, he is showing us that, that if we really believe, it's going to show in our lives. You see, the word yourselves here is an insidious deception from within. The, when you put deceiving yourselves, here's the picture, is that it is a, it is a slow it is a hidden deception. And where does it come from? From within. It comes from the heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all else and desperately sick. Who can know it? Listen, when you're, when you're watching a TV show, I hope you don't watch too many of them. There's a bunch of junk out there. You're, you're listening to the news. It's pretty bad news. Um, be careful with that too, that'll get you down. Um, but when you're, when you're looking at our culture or you're standing there um, in the lunchroom at work or at school and you hear somebody say, well, you know, you just got to trust your heart. You just got to do what your heart says is the right thing to do. Be very careful about that. You can quote to them Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all else and desperately sick. Who can know it? Many people are trusting their heart and they're trusting their heart on the way to hell because their heart can be sickened and their heart is sick and it needs the Savior to come and give us a new heart. Be very careful about that. What, you say, well, what do we trust then? This is what we trust. And it was, well, how do I do that? It's so big and I don't know it. Well, that's part of the reason you're here. You, you come and you study the Word. That's part of the reason that we, we have a bookstore that, that first and foremost sells Bibles. The whole back wall is Bibles. 
That's why you need to be in the Word. That's why there's study Bibles in there so that you can read it and there's notes at the bottom that as you read it and as you study it and as you look at it, that you can come to, to understand what God's Word says. You just read the Word. You come to the preaching of the Word. And if you seek God, you come with a ready heart asking God to help you not just hear it, but to listen and listen. And then to say, Lord, I want to be one who does your word to obey. You begin to do that. And God, the creator of the universe, who made your own individual mind and soul, he will come and he will work in your heart and help you with that. When you sit down to read the word, you say, Lord, help me to understand your word. When I sit down to read his word, I just say, Lord, I, 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 my heart is sick. My mind is limited. Holy Spirit, come and speak to me. If you will pray that prayer, meaning it, before God as you run to his word, God will speak to you. So you just look at that sheet, top to bottom, look at the whole thing. Be a doer of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. The picture is, is that God calls us to be true followers of him. I can tell you that as a freshman at Florida State University, I remember when this became real to me. I was living in Landis Hall at Florida State, and I remember being very conflicted in my walk with God. I wanted to do the right thing, but I often struggled with honoring the Lord. I often um, just would, would just have a great turmoil in my heart. And I remember at one point with pressure academically, pressure financially, pressure socially, I just remember being really broken before the Lord and not knowing what to do. And I just went to Him in prayer over a period of a few days. I spent a lot of time in prayer. And I said, Lord, how do I deal with this stress? How do I deal with these pressures? Who am I supposed to be? What is it that you want me to do? And there were two words that came up as I just really sought the Lord. The word trust came up. That the Lord was just saying, you need to learn to trust me. You need to learn to trust what I've said. You have to trust me. Hebrews chapter 11, without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's impossible to please Him without trusting Him. But with faith, He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. That's Hebrews eleven six. He is a rewarder. So I just remember the word trust was very, very strong, and the word right behind it was obey. Andrew, if you will trust me and if you will obey me, you will be who I want you to be. And I, I just remember, and it didn't even have to do with the hymn, trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. I, I, I wasn't even talking about that, but that, though the reality of that, God just began to do a work of saying, okay, so what does it mean to obey? What do you want me to do? The amazing thing is when you begin to ask God, what do you want me to do? And you're spending time in his word and you're spending time in prayer with the phone where it won't buzz and interrupt you or ding, or do whatever it's doing, and you start devoting time to seeking God, you'll know what to do. He will put things in front of you to do. And sometimes they'll be very small, very small. And when you obey them, he speaks more. You see, to whom a little bit is given, and he's faithful with a little, much follows. And so you, you begin to obey in the smallest of ways. God begins to speak. So what is our only hope? 
And I believe our only hope is to believe the gospel. Jesus being, began by saying, just repent and believe. Believe the gospel. Receive the gospel. That's what this passage says on the front side where it says in verse um, 21, he says, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. You believe him. You receive the truth. And then what is that other one? You obey. Now, here's the amazing thing, and you see this on the screen. Isaiah 55 Really, verses 1 through 11 say this, but verse 11. Just look at verse 11. You remember, this has all been about God's Word. What do you do with God's Word? It's all been about that. That's that's what James is talking about, is what do you do with God's instructions? Do you just hear them and go away unchanged, or do you say, no, I believe I receive this Word and I will obey. And James says, great, if you're, if you're one who obeys, then it shows you're a Christian. Notice this. Isaiah 55, 1 through 11, and verse 11 says, so shall what? My word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Now, here's the picture. The word has gone out to you. Some of you are going to receive, believe, and obey the word. And that means that it will have accomplished what God did. It always accomplished. It it always accomplishes the reason that he sent it out. Some are not going to believe and receive. Some some are just going to say, no, I'm good. Stepped on my toes a little bit. Don't appreciate that too much. Not sure I'll be back next week. Okay. But just know this, that those who gladly receive the, the Word and do it, those are the men, those are the women who build their lives on the rock of Jesus Christ. And when the trouble comes and when the world tests it, their house stands firm. Their faith is true. But those who do not do the Word of God build their life upon the sands of this life And when the storm comes, how great is the fall of that life. Let's pray.